Richard Nixon served in the United States Navy from 1942 to 1946 in the Pacific Theater during World War II, attaining the rank of commander. He was elected to Congress in 1947, to the Senate in 1950, and would become President Eisenhower's vice president from 1953 until January of 1961, following his loss to John F. Kennedy in the 1960 U.S. presidential election. But during his time as vice president, Nixon became heavily involved in foreign affairs and would even take a trip to the Soviet Union, where he publicly humiliated Khrushchev like a legend. In the 1960s, President Kennedy and Nixon got along pretty well as both had mutual respect for one another. Kennedy would call for Nixon's advice following the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, and Nixon decided not to run in 1964, but would win a lot of write-in votes. He would, however, be elected in 1968 following a massive split in the Democratic Party. President Nixon adopted the Nixon Doctrine where the United States would maintain all of its treaty commitments and would provide a shield over any allied country threatened by a nuclear power, a.k.a. the Soviet Union, which is deemed vital to U.S. national security, and that the U.S. will provide assistance to other nations threatened by aggression, but it will be the threatened nation that is to be the primary country responsible for their own defense. The Nixon Doctrine was praised by many, but angered Mobutu Sese Seko in Zaire, modern-day Congo, who was an authoritarian ruler and who had been supported by Johnson. And Mobutu turned to Maoist China for support, which the communist Chinese were more than happy to give as they started to envision a Chinese-backed African bloc of countries led by Zaire. In Africa, President Nixon was appalled by the Nigerian government's use of starvation against the Biafran minority breakaway region and encouraged the American public to take part in the Biafran airlift by non-government organizations to provide humanitarian relief. The airlift was the largest humanitarian operation since the Berlin airlift from 1948 to 49, and this was in stark contrast to Lyndon Johnson who talked about the Biafrans like he was in an old school Call of Duty lobby. Nixon continued the policies of Kennedy and Johnson regarding the anti-colonial struggle in Africa as both the U.S. and Soviets painted themselves as supporters of independence movements. This had begun in 1961 for the Angolans and continued until 1974 with the Portuguese coup d'etat. The U.S. supported UNITA while the Soviets backed the faction of MPLA and U.S. and Soviet allies also supported their factions in the Civil War after the War of Independence ended. Regarding Iraq, Nixon's administration was confronted with an early foreign policy crisis when the Ba'athist regime publicly executed nine Iraqi Jews on fabricated espionage charges at the end of January 1969. Nixon initially sought to get U.S. allies such as Spain, India, and France that had close ties with the Ba'athist government to apply pressure onto the country for this crime against humanity, but that went nowhere. Nixon then began to revise Johnson's Twin Pillars policy, after Britain withdrew its troops from the Suez Canal and the U.S. increased support for the Shah's Iran, for regional stability, and the Persian Gulf. And as punishment to the Ba'athist government, the Shah decided to increase support for Iraqi Kurds against Iraq and to sponsor a failed coup attempt in 1970 within Iraq. There had been allegations that the U.S. supported the Kurds in the first Iraqi Kurdish war, but nothing has been confirmed. However, President Nixon did support the Kurds during the second Iraqi Kurdish war from 1974 to 1975. However, the war ended after Iran, who was a major belligerent and supporter of the Kurds, decided to accept an Iraqi offer for the Shat al-Arab waterway in exchange for ending Iranian support for the Kurds and ending the war. In October of 1973, the Yom Kippur War kicked off with a surprise attack from Egypt and Syria against Israel to retake territory that they had lost during the 1967 Six-Day War. Nixon's Secretary of State Henry Kissinger flew to Moscow to engage in negotiations with the Soviets to exercise restraint regarding their support for the Egyptians and Syrians as tensions between the superpowers escalated. The U.S. launched Operation Nickel Grass to supply Israel with supplies and equipment for one month, and although it greatly improved Israel's strategic position, the result would be the 1973 oil crisis. The U.S. conducted this operation to prevent Israel from putting nuclear weapons onto the table during the war. Additionally, Kissinger's address to the United Nations declared that the U.S. would begin mediation between the Arab-Israeli conflict immediately. The U.S. helped settle the uneasy ceasefire between the belligerents of the Yom Kippur War, and Nixon began setting the stage for the future Camp David Accords, which would take place in the Carter administration. Nixon had Kissinger act as the mediator between Israel, Egypt, and Syria in what is known as shuttle diplomacy over disputes between them. The result was the 1974 Israel-Egypt Disengagement Treaty, and became the 1975 Sinai Interim Agreement between Israel and Egypt, where the two countries agreed to settle disputes diplomatically instead of militarily. 
This also greatly improved ties between Egypt and the Western world. Regarding Iran, President Nixon had a very good relationship with Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who was overjoyed when he heard about the Nixon Doctrine. The Shah increased his purchases of U.S. equipment such as F-4 Phantom II jets and took a heavy role in cracking down on Soviet subversion within Iran. But with all Iran. of that, Nixon and the Shah had a very good relationship, to the point where Richard Nixon believed that the Shah's Iran was the United States' greatest ally in the Persian Gulf and Middle East. One of President Nixon's primary foreign policy successes was his policy regarding China. He focused on reducing the dangers of Cold War tensions among the Soviet Union and the Chinese. President Nixon's policy sought detente with both nations, with the U.S. and each other in the wake of the Sino-Soviet split, as China and the USSR had begun to make moves against each other. Nixon moved away from the traditional American policy of containment of communism, hoping that each side would seek American favor. Nixon's 1972 visit to China ushered in a new era of U.S.-Chinese relations and effectively removed China as a Cold War foe. Nixon toured the architectural landmarks including the Forbidden City, Ming Tombs, and of course the Great Wall. Americans received their first glimpse into Chinese life through the cameras which accompanied Richard and Pat Nixon while they toured the city of Beijing and visited communes, schools, factories, and hospitals. During his visit to China, Nixon agreed to not put nukes in Japan, and in exchange, China agreed not to intervene in the Vietnam War. Okay, time for the big one, Vietnam. To start, President Nixon had been elected in 1968 on a campaign platform to achieve peace with honor in the Vietnam War. There had been many anti-war protests, and most of the American public disapproved of President Lyndon Johnson's handling of the war, especially after the Tet Offensive occurred in early 1968. Therefore, Nixon's promise to end the war in Vietnam was very popular among the American public. One of the main policies that the Nixon administration enacted in the war was Vietnamization, where the U.S. gradually shifted security control of South Vietnam to the South Vietnamese government, while withdrawing their own forces to prevent the immediate total collapse of the country. Vietnamization was a large factor in the Nixon doctrine about shifting the primary responsibility of the defense of other countries to themselves. In 1969, Nixon began the covert bombing of Cambodia in Operation Menu, targeting North Vietnamese positions in the country without consent from the Cambodian government. Menu was succeeded by Operation Freedom Deal in 1970 with the support of the Cambodian government against the North Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge. The Nixon administration also expanded the bombing of Laos in 1971 as both Laos and Cambodia faced civil wars at the same time as the war in Vietnam, and the Vietnam War had shot up the civil war escalation. These bombings were also mainly targeted at North Vietnamese positions along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which had been undermining the South Vietnamese's national security concerns throughout the 1960s. Operation Linebacker 1 was enacted from May to October of 1972 after the North Vietnamese Easter Offensive began against the South Vietnamese. South Vietnam's morale shot up and they held firm against the communists and were further strengthened with renewed American resolve. You see, Linebacker 1 was a renewed massive bombing campaign against North Vietnam. Nixon had also ordered the mining of all North Vietnamese harbors, which the Johnson administration had always vetoed out of fear of communist, Soviet, and Chinese intervention. But Nixon's detente policies and extensive foreign affairs experience ensured that this didn't happen. Operation Linebacker 2 came later in 1972, where the North Vietnamese had left the negotiating table to try and gain more territory from the South Vietnamese to be in a better position for a renewed round of negotiations. Nixon, however, wasn't having any of this, and ordered Operation Linebacker 2 in December to once again renew the bombing campaign of North Vietnam. Following this bombing, the North Vietnamese were shaken and strongly demoralized to the point that the Chinese and Soviet Union strongly advised the North Vietnamese to return to the negotiating table. You see, Nixon had subscribed to the, quote, madman theory, where he presented himself to the North Vietnamese as an irrational force to lash out against communist aggression as a means of deterrence to avoid provocation against the United States in the Cold War as a whole. But regarding Vietnam, it was a method of getting North Vietnam to sit down and agree to end the war. Examples were the U.S. incursions into Cambodia and, of course, the renewed bombing campaigns in 1972. One of the main issues of the war was the status of American POWs who were held by the North Vietnamese. Americans captured by the North Vietnamese had been brutally tortured, denied proper medical treatment, and kept in appalling conditions. And although POW started to come back in the U.S. in their Operation Homecoming, the North Vietnamese would never be charged with any crimes against humanity. After years of fighting, the Paris Peace Accords were finally signed at the beginning of 1973. The agreement implemented a ceasefire and allowed for the withdrawal of remaining American troops. 
However, it did not require the 160,000 North Vietnamese Army regulars located in South Vietnam to withdraw. By the end of March 1973, U.S. military forces had been withdrawn from the country. Once American combat support ended, there was a brief truce, but fighting quickly broke out once again as both North and South Vietnam violated the truce. In 1971, the Indo-Pakistani War broke out over the secession of East Pakistan from West Pakistan as the two were separated by India. East Pakistan sought to become Bangladesh, and at this time the U.S. was courting China as a potential ally against the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and the Soviets fully supported India and also sought to undermine China. U.N. Ambassador George H.W. Bush called for an immediate ceasefire, however this was vetoed by the Soviets at the U.N. China supported Pakistan, and the U.S. was also a strong ally of Pakistan at the time. However, the American Congress prohibited any military aid from going to Pakistan during the war, but Nixon decided to ignore this and also encouraged Iran to send aid to Pakistan despite telegrams showing that there were many war crimes going on in Bangladesh by Pakistani forces. After the war's end, India was victorious and the U.S. warmed relations with India once again following China's satisfaction over the Pakistan situation. Regarding Latin America, Nixon was a hardliner on the Cuba situation against Fidel Castro, so much so to the point that he had stated that had he won in 1960, he would have insisted that President Eisenhower enacted the Bay of Pigs invasion in late 1960. Additionally, he made a major Latin America policy of his to be targeting Cuban influence and their allies within the region. One area in Latin America that is disputed is the 1973 Chilean coup which brought Augusto Pinochet into power. It's argued how much American involvement occurred with some sources claiming that the U.S. provided minimal support for the coup, while others claim that Kissinger was knee-deep in organizing the coup. On detente, the Nixon administration signed the Anti-Ballistic Missiles Treaty with the Soviet Union and organized a conference that led to the signing of the Helsinki Accords after Nixon left office. Nixon and Kissinger achieved breakthrough agreements with Moscow on the limitation of anti-ballistic missiles and the interim agreement on strategic missiles. Nixon was proud that he had achieved an agreement that his predecessors were unable to reach, thanks to his diplomatic skills. The U.S. also attempted to mediate the Sino-Soviet split, where both sides had threatened war against one another, and Nixon accomplished the Strategic Arms Limitations Talks from 1969 to 1972, which heavily de-escalated the course of the Cold War. As a side note, President Nixon would also heavily crack down against the Mafia within the United States as well as other organized crime networks. Furthermore, the United States under Nixon would initiate the War on Drugs and Operation Intercept on the U.S.-Mexico border against marijuana. All of this is, of course, just a mere summary of President Nixon's major foreign policy and its results. Like all presidents, many decisions were made with incomplete information and without the benefit of hindsight. But what did you think of Nixon's foreign policy? Let me know in the comments, and thank you for watching.